Everybody talks about the benefits of gardening, especially that you can save money. But can you actually do that when you're gardening for the first time? I decided to find out. During my experiment this year, what I found was something fascinating. Here are some of my tips that actually helped me save money on groceries this year, and I hope they help you too. When we look at lush gardens of fellow gardeners, we don't think about all the costs that go in into the buildup of these gardens. When I started vegetable gardening this year, it was an interesting and very unique experience for me. But one thing was very clear to me early on. Saving money on groceries by growing my own vegetables was not as easy or straightforward as people made it to be. Focused attention. I had minimum amount of time, so I decided to concentrate my efforts on two things. One being growing only the vegetables and fruits that we were actually going to consume. And second, growing varieties that did well in my zone of 10A and my coastal microclimate. I didn't want to sink in too many funds in this project, especially on vegetables that I was not even going to eat every week. The best place I found to look at this was look at my grocery list and look at the 10 to 15 vegetables that kept repeating over and over again every week. Choosing the right varieties. One of my big grocery bill costs always used to be herbs as I use them regularly for my cooking. I planted a lot of herbs in my vegetable garden this year and that helped me save a huge chunk of change for every weekly grocery bill. Once I knew which vegetables I was interested in growing in, I started researching which one of them would work best in my area and also in the season that I was trying to grow. There are two kinds of crops, warm season crops and cool season crops. Warm season crops work best in the months of late spring, summer and early fall. Cool season crops work best in late fall, winter, and early spring. I was looking at what would work best in my area of zone 10A. During my research, I found a local seed company called the San Diego Seed Company that was selling organic seeds that would work best in my zone. I felt like I hit the jackpot here. Not only would I be supporting a local and small business, but it also meant that this particular company had already vetted and tested out what varieties grew best in my zone. Another great to research is to ask your neighbors or friends who are gardening in a similar zone as you. The next step for me was buying seeds. This was going to be one of the bigger expenses because I was starting from scratch. Also, the more vegetables and the more varieties you want to grow, the more expensive this can get. So try to be conservative in the beginning when you're trying to pick the right varieties for your garden. A great tip is to ask your neighbors who are growing vegetables for extra seeds if they have any, or even better to barter with them if possible. If you're starting from scratch and don't have any vegetable seeds to barter with, you can barter flowers that, that you're growing in the garden or even succulents. In my case, I was growing tulips and roses this year and I decided to barter using those for various seeds. Now, this will not only helps you save money, but will also help you find vegetable seeds that grow best in your area. I have a great community of neighbors who is always sharing plant clippings and also sometimes extra seedlings that they are growing in their garden. This is a great way to find some unique and rare herbs that you can't even find on the market, like my Tulsi basil. Supplies. This is another area that can be a huge drain on your wallet, especially if you're a beginner gardener. Because I was starting for the first time for vegetables, I had to start with the seed starting soil, compost, gardening soil, and most importantly, raised beds because I didn't have a space for vegetables in my garden. I do consider the raised beds as an investment because I feel like within a year, they have already returned investment on whatever money I had put into them. I also tried not to buy too many other supplies as I wasn't sure how successful I was going to be or even if I was going to like it a year down the lane. So I decided to be very conservative with my spending there. When it came to tools for beginner vegetable gardeners, these are the five tools I would recommend. A hand trowel, a very good quality pruning shear. I would recommend a Felco shear, gloves, a spray bottle for any organic pesticides or even foliar fertilizers that you want to spray, 
and finally a bucket. Now all of these can be fairly inexpensive except for the pruning shears. That will be slightly expensive and I would highly recommend investing into that because once you buy a good pruning shear, it will last you a lifetime. I bought the raised beds itself because I wanted them to have a little bit of a height. But if you don't care about the height, I would just buy setter two by fours and then arrange them into a rectangle or a square as you need. You can also get them cut as per your size requirements at your local hardware store. You can create a great Nordic garden with these two by fours by lining it with recycled cardboard, green clippings from your garden, even leaves if you're in fall. And if you live somewhere closer to the ocean like I, I do, you can collect seaweed from the beaches and let it dry in sun before you add it to your bed if you're worried about the salt content in the seaweed. Top of the no day grazed bed would be lined with compost and for this compost I would first recommend checking in with your own city because some cities actually provide free compost. My city here in San Diego provides free compost up to a certain point that you're responsible to come and collect in your own car or truck water. Like me, if you live in a drought-ridden state like California, the water bills can be really high. One of the ways I have saved on my water bill this year is by using drip irrigation so that I am watering my garden efficiently while also keeping the costs low. Proper utilization of space. This was key as I had a very tiny space to work with. I had three two feet by four feet raised beds. I didn't want to waste money and space on vegetables that were too much effort, even though I was eating them every, every week or every other week. But I didn't think it would be worth the effort that it would be required to grow them and also the amount of time it would need to shell them. The other thing I did was grow vegetables vertically wherever I could. And this was key for me to grow indeterminate tomatoes that were seven to eight feet tall in a very small amount of space. I used the hook and string method to vertically grow these tomatoes and hook them up rather than on a vertical trellis just on my pre-existing fence. I wanted to save money on the vertical trellis because I didn't know if I would be successful in growing these tomatoes and secondly I didn't know if I would end up using them next year. Now that I have grown them very successfully this year using this method I might invest a little bit more for vertical trellises for next year for the rest of my vegetables like cucumbers and peas. Realistic expectations. I wanted to have realistic expectations in the form that I was not going to grow a huge variety of just one thing. I decided I wanted to plant less of just one variety and try to mix it up with different varieties. For example, when it came to tomatoes, I had about six different tomato plants and I didn't repeat a single variety. This not only helped me try out six different varieties of tomatoes and that still ended up helping me reduce costs for the year, but now it's also given me enough information to see which varieties I like the best and which varieties I wanted to grow again for next year. For example, I'm definitely going to grow cherry tomatoes and grape tomatoes. They work wonderfully well in my garden and I absolutely love the amount of produce each plant gave me. Get the timing right. As my garden transitioned from summer to fall, I planted seedlings that would go in into my fall garden. But because of travel and sickness, it was not possible for me to get those seedlings in time into my vegetable garden. I feel like that ended up being a bit of a drain on my wallet this year. And if I want to save money and not lose money on the seeds and seedlings that I'm growing, I need to plan this part better in terms of timing. This will also be key for anyone who is planning to start their garden for next year. And if you're planning to start seeds indoors, I would recommend looking at your frost calendar to see when does your frost end. So you don't have seedlings that are not ready in time to go into the garden. And secondly, seedlings that are overgrown and just leggy and are unhealthy, giving you less of a produce. My seedlings also died because of a heat wave this year, which was unavoidable. But that is something to account for if you're planning for your garden so that you have more seedlings than you need. This is something even I'm going to work on for next year where I have extra seedlings in case I lose some of them. And this tip is less about saving money and more about not losing money so that 
that you don't end up having wastage of seeds or wastage of seedlings. So I agree that gardening can save you money and it has saved me money on this year, but I had to be very strategic about it. And if you want to see a 60-day transformation of this particular vegetable garden, click on this video right here.